Castle Goring from Nikki Aurora and from me. Well, 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 I will plunge right in with a correction from Katrina Bell. And may I say, I have actually been very heartened by the fact that so many people have such wonderful knowledge that I actually am becoming quite confident that if I think I'm making a mistake, it will be corrected and that I don't need to really worry about the mistake sitting out there uncorrected. Katrina Bell says, correction. Hi, Lady C. I'm sure I'm not the only one who will mention this you weren't but it's rule Britannia, not land of hope and glory you were referring to. It's the final song from Thomas Arne's mask, King Alfred, performed first for Frederick, Prince of Wales. You're absolutely right. Do you know when I was saying it, I thought, mm, I don't think that's right. And then I thought, I'm not going to check it. <laughs> if I'm wrong, somebody's sure to tell me. And thank you so much. I was wrong. But you know when you sort of think you're wrong, but you think maybe you're not wrong. And anyway, so, and of course, the Frederick Prince of Wales, for whom it was performed, was none other than the person who, the first Duchess of Marlborough, Sarah Churchill, wanted her granddaughter, Lady Diana Spencer, to marry and was willing to pay him £250,000 in those days, which was, of course, a vast sum of money for the privilege of her granddaughter becoming Princess of Wales. Well, it didn't happen. So you're absolutely right. It was, and you're not the only person who said it. Incidentally, several other people said it. And thank you so much. Thank you. Paul Donham says, it looks the recent photo of Karen Middleton and Catherine in the vehicle is photoshopped. No security anywhere. Also, Catherine's image blurred and the vehicle has five tires. Back grid name on photo. Well, Paul Donham, I actually think it's not a fake and I'm delighted that it was taken. Oh, I don't think it's Carl Larson who took it because I think he would have had his name on it, Carl Larson stroke back grid. But I wouldn't have put it past him because he's got a lot of initiative. And of course, as we all know, he's in bed with back grid and Megan. So, but I don't think it was him because he likes having his name on the photographs and that would have been a feather in his cap. But you know, I have nothing against paparazzi, I've got to tell you. A paparazzo has as much right to earn a living as anybody else. And as long as he goes about his business in a manner that is not actually going to break the law or morally invade the space of his subject. When you're in public, to an extent you are public property and you cannot expect the privacy that you would have in private in public. I actually think it's a very good thing that that photograph was taken. I think it silenced an awful lot of people 
who had all sorts of fantastical notions. And since I have been asked by one of the leading journalists in the United States of America, if I know what's wrong with, what was wrong with Catherine, and she is totally honorable and she's utterly decent, and I fessed up that I did know what's wrong with her, but I am bound to secrecy because I gave my word of honor I wouldn't repeat it to the person who told me. Uh, I think it's actually great that the naysayers and the doom mongers have to an extent been silenced by Catherine's visible presence with her mother. So more than that, I don't want to say. Uh, you know, the only reason why I ever end up getting information is because if I say I'm not going to repeat something, I don't. Well, of course, if I should hear it from several other people, and I'm sure in the fullness of time, I will hear it from other people. And when or if it ever becomes appropriate, and I will not be giving anybody else <laughs> uh, my mausoleum assurance, then should it at some point in the future become appropriate? At that point, I might consider uh, imparting the information, but there's no reason now. She is on the mend. What happened to her has happened to other people. And more than that, I'm not going to say. And it's certainly nothing cancerous or uh, that sort of thing. So people can be assured she's on the mend and hopefully she's going to be okay for the next 60 or 70 years. So at least 50. <laughs> Kitty says, Dear Lady C, the media seems to be spinning a new drama alleging that the Middletons, Carol and Catherine in particular, are very upset with their brother, Uncle Gary, for agreeing to be a part of that reality show, I'm a Celebrity. It's actually Celebrity Big Brother. I was in I'm a Celebrity, get me out of here. That's the one in the jungle in Australia. Celebrity Big Brother takes place in a house, a studio actually, that's constructed as if it were in part a house on the outskirts of London because I've done some of their shows although I said when they asked me if I would go in I said not a penny less than five million pounds <laughs> well that tells you how keen I was to go in anyway to continue the question one of their key concerns is that even if he'll be discreet and won't spill anything particularly personal about Catherine, the show will attempt to misrepresent it anyway for the sake of drama and ratings. How true is that? Are they really that upset or is it the media spinning it out to sell more ads? The media, my dear, is always spinning it out to earn themselves more money and sucking more advertising. It's the name of the game. Their middle name is sensationalism. Their other middle name is exaggeration. Yet another one of their middle names is sanctimoniousness. So they've got plenty of middle names. They could be a Roman aristocrat with four surnames and 10 or 12 
Christian names. So, um, my understanding is that he's a free agent. He's a multimillionaire. There was actually a very good article in the Mail by Claudia Joseph, who is a very, very fine journalist. She interviewed me many years ago when she was first starting out. And I was very impressed with not only her interviewing technique, her writing ability, but her humanity. And she interviewed Gary Goldsmith some time ago, and they have become good friends. And she basically said in her piece that she doubts very much that he is going to embarrass his family. And I agree with that. I'm pretty sure he's not going to embarrass himself or his, well, he might embarrass himself, but he's not going to embarrass the family. He's what's known as a character. And by and large, the British love characters. And as long as they sense that somebody is authentically himself, which he evidently is, and that they have no malice in them, which he doesn't. He certainly doesn't like Harry and Meghan, and he certainly dislikes Meghan intensely for good reason. But that's not malicious. Disliking somebody who it's justified to dislike is not maliciousness. I think it's called good judgment. Also, in this case, good taste. You know, all well-placed families have embarrassing relations and or relations who skirt on the edge and who are characters and who people tolerate. And they may try to restrain them, but if they are unrestrainable, they sort of think, oh, well, here goes Uncle Gary yet again. And Uncle Gary will be fulfilling a very valuable function because he will be getting the point across that his niece Catherine is lovely and that she certainly didn't deserve any of the abuse to which she was subjected. He, his opening speech, so to speak, in the Big Brother house was that Meghan has rewritten history, which she has, and that Harry, William and Catherine were very close, which everybody knew they were, and that Harry loved Catherine, which everybody knows he did, and he used to admit it. He used to say she was the sister he'd never had. Now, she's been tarred with the Meganian brush, and she is cold, and she's formal, and my goodness, she has integrity. She doesn't have a public face and a private face. She has a face. My goodness, that's a real failing as Meghan has pointed out to Harry, and Harry has pointed out to the world. I don't think, and this is my personal opinion, that the Middleton family is going to be that concerned. You know, when you're in the public eye, you get used to the brick bats. You get used to a certain amount of swiping. And you just put up with it. And I think it's going to be very entertaining. And since we have the negatives out there, why not let's have a positive? And I say, Good on you, Uncle Gary. <laughs> really. Also, Uncle Gary 
might end up being regarded as a national treasure. Because once people get to know figures, whether public figures or private individuals who then become public figures, and they decide they like them and that they like their values and that they are authentic individuals, they usually embrace them to their bosom. Wouldn't that be a poke in Megsy Baby's eye if everybody ends up loving Uncle Gary and everybody still doesn't like Megsy Baby? Well, I don't know why they don't like me. I'm as authentic as a $3 bill. I really am, you know. I mean, everything about me is natural. My nose, my teeth. <laughs> oh, look at those barracuda teeth. My personality. Oh, my hair. I mean, everything about me is authentic. Oh, today, actually, I forgot to brown up, so that's authentic, too. Can you imagine? The color of my forehead matches the color of my scalp. That's a rarity, isn't it? Shows how authentic I truly am. Mm. What a contrast. I have a feeling Uncle Gary might end up being a national treasure. And I think it would be a guinea a minute. So, I hope that answers the question. Marilyn Bell says, Lady C, what do you make of Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene telling Emily Maitlis to F off when she tried to provoke her? <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. No implication as to the habits of Marjorie Taylor Greene, I hasten to add. Well, I actually saw the clip. I loved it. Well, there was an event at Mar-a-Lago and Emily Maitlis was very mischievous because Emily Maitlis was playing the anti-Semitic card. She is a Jewess and she was playing it at Mar-a-Lago, which is the club that Donald Trump owned that welcomed Jews. I first went to Mar-a-Lago some years ago when I was staying in Palm Beach as a guest of Fred and Jean Scharf. They He's unfortunately passed away, but she is a very stylish woman and he was great. Uh, he was a lovely, lovely man. And he helped to fund the Arnold Scarcy exhibition at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. That's how I met him and her. And then they asked me to go down to say guests to Palm Beach which I did and they put me up very beautifully and I often had lunch at Mar-a-Lago with Fred and in Palm Beach Jews are not allowed into the Everglades or the Breakers clubs. I think there's one Jew who is a member of the Everglades and introduces himself as the token Jew, by the way. Uh, now, for Emily Maitlis to be playing the anti-Semitic card at Mar-a-Lago, and I don't know whether Marjorie Taylor Greene is Jewish or not. It's very difficult to tell in America who is and who isn't. But certainly Donald Trump's son-in-law is Jewish. His daughter Ivanka became Jewish. It is extremely offensive to 
any Jew who is a supporter of Donald Trump, and I would imagine anybody who is not Jewish who is a supporter of Donald Trump, that a journalist and a Jewish journalist at that would so cynically play that card. I mean, and I'm going to read out the exchange because it it was typical Emily Maitlis. She really is so vicious and offensive. So she says, why do so many people that support Donald Trump love conspiracy theories, including yourself? He seems to attract a lot of conspiracy theorists. Well, <laughs> The Congresswoman replied, we like the truth, like supporting our constitutions and our freedoms and putting America first. Then Emily Maitlis said, playing the anti-Semitic card, what about Jewish space lasers? Tell us about Jewish space lasers. And Congresswoman Green cut her off, and I thought she was brilliant. She said, we're all done now. Why don't you go talk about Jewish space laces? And really, why don't you F off? And she didn't use the abbreviated version. <laughs> and she sailed off into the sunset, leaving Emily Maitlis gawking. You know, it really is very unseemly. And now I say this as the great granddaughter of a Jewess who is regarded by Orthodox Jews as Jewish, even though I'm not. I'm a practicing Christian. Nevertheless, I make the point I, that I think it is truly offensive that anybody would play a race card and that any Jew would play a race card in a Jewish environment for political gain. We all know what Emily Maitlis's sympathies are and I think it would have been equally offensive if she had played a different card with P President Biden. So I make that point that so I am not being partisan in all of this. I am simply making the point that there are some things that responsible individuals and responsible journalists don't do. And I say, great on Congresswoman Green. <laughs> I thought she handled it wonderfully well. <laughs> Sorry. And you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong in telling somebody to be off the way. <laughs> Congresswoman Green told Emily Maitlis, if ever anybody deserved it, it was her. And people often think that ladies never swear. I've never met a lady who didn't, except in my grandparents' generation. My grandmother would never have sworn, nor my grandfather, but in their generation, but in my parents' generation and in my generation and in subsequent generations, everybody swears. As Princess Margaret used to say, she'd much rather hear the F word than a blasphemous expression. <laughs> so I thought, good on her. Heidi Miggs says, Dear Lady C, I'm sure you've heard already a report about a woman who parted with the spare years ago in Las Vegas. Woman is in quotation marks. 
saying she has photos and will be posting them on OnlyFans. I found it hilarious. Who knows whether it's true or not? But just the thought of it being true delights me no end. I think she might have been covered in the sun. And what do I make of it? Again, I have to say I love Americans. <laughs> so to the point. <laughs> the lady's name is Carrie Royale. She is 52. Uh, when Harry was uh, cavorting nude in the Wynn Hotel room in 2012, she was involved with the situation and she has photographs. And I have to tell you, they were took, they were, they were taken fair and square. Harry may have been out of his mind, but nobody forced anything down his throat or up his nose. Or anywhere else. And if he was out of his mind, and according to all people who were there, he certainly was out of his mind. Nobody forced him to strip. And if she has photographs of them, I think it's good, clean money that she will be earning, especially after Harry has violated, and I'm not going to mention her name, the girl with whom he had his introduction, let's put it that way, whose identity he made sure he not only lied about to, to make himself seem a victim of an older woman when she's younger than Megan, but he also gave so many clues that everybody knew who she was, who knew her anything about the Beaufort Polo Club and Sherborne, where Lady Edith Foxwell had her house etc 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 i don't so i think you're getting the point that i'm trying to make which is that harry has very nastily violated people's privacy and if somebody took photographs and is going to make money out of it and if it is going to be carrie royale I would have to say, good on you, Carrie Royale, because Harry needs to have a taste of his own medicine. And let's remember that Harry will be not standing proudly no matter what happens in those photographs. So I think that we will see him at his uh, very worst. I think going off what I learned in biology, you could almost say that he will have to an extent been retroactive but the pictures will tell the tale. And I think if ever anybody deserved it, it's Harry. And if she wants to make some money out of it, I'm willing to cut her some slack. And Harry not behaved as he has behaved, I would have taken an entirely different view on the matter. I would have thought he had been naughty indiscreet and she should not take advantage of the situation. But Harry has shown himself to be so adept at taking advantage of everybody and everything and every situation that I think 
Carry Royale. Do it. I for one will look. <laughs> I believe in encouraging entrepreneurship against people who have behaved as appallingly as Harry has behaved. So, Finn Wolf says, the Duke and Duchess are demonstrating poor planning, lack of judgment, and the harm they are doing to themselves. They are leaving themselves open to attack over and over. If there were a more sinister plot going on, they would be more covert. Sin Wolf, that was my point. And you're not the only person who has agreed with me. Other people have made it. And they have made it as ably as you have. And thank you for making it so succinctly. Harry and Meghan are a pack of lone wolves hunting together, if that makes sense. A pack of two. They have appalling judgment, but then they are very impetuous, both of them. She used to be restrained until his importance went to her head. She used to be able to exercise restraint. Then she got a taste for indulging narcissistic rage. I have arisen. Everybody's going to bow down, and if you don't, I'm going to crack that whip and make sure that you do. You've got to know your place. Your place is with my foot on top of your head. Don't forget it. Elibet! Get him! <sighs> hmm. Poor judgment, yes. Poor planning, very calculated planning. As Nikki Pretty, her childhood friend until her early 30s, from the age of two till her early 30s, said, Megan is very calculating and strategic. And on the way up, she was very successful. She knew how to get there and how to manipulate her way there and how to pretend to be a wonderful person. And then on to the next, because she needed to maintain the act of how wonderful she was. Then she not only arrived, but she has arisen. And she doesn't need to pretend anymore. It's the raw exercise of power. As I used to say about my mother, it's a very narcissistic thing to do. Narcissists, I have observed as a result of my researches and my experience with my mother, when they're younger and they are at the peak of their attractiveness, they lure you in with their allure. Once they have reached a stage in life where they think, oh, I don't need to be bothered to be nice anymore. I've got all the power I want. I can crack the whip. That's the point at which they don't bother and they just crack the whip. Unless, of course, it suits them to pretend to be nice to someone else, then they do. But maintaining the act the way they do in their 20s and 30s, oh, Leonsville, I can't be bothered with that anymore. No, I'm powerful now. I'm going to exercise my power. And that's what they do. It shows lack of judgment. It shows that 
they never plan beyond the fruition of their objective. So everything falls apart. Which is exactly what has been happening with Meghan and Harry. And they are unaware of the harm they're doing to themselves because personalities like that never consider themselves responsible for their failings because they don't have failings. We are the ones who have the failings. What they have is perfection and what we have is the inability to appreciate their perfection. We are the ones who are lacking. They're not lacking. They are disasters as operatives. They really are. They are along the lines of Matahari, that poor, pathetic, deluded adventuress who ended up blindfolded at dawn because she loved posing as a possible spy. When the likelihood is she was nothing but a poser. Well, she got her comeuppance blindfolded at dawn. Harry and Meghan are getting their comeuppance without a blindfold 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It's kicked in and it's gonna continue to kick. Sunshine Rain says, Dan Wooten has parted company with GB News a day after media-regulated Ofcom found that an episode of his show broke its broadcasting rules. Wooten was suspended by the channel in September after comments by Lawrence Fox about a female journalist prompted 8,867 complaints to the watchdog. Ofcom's ruling published on Monday, the 4th of March, said Fox's remarks were clearly and unambiguously misogynistic. On the 26th September episode of Dan Wooten Tonight, Fox made remarks about journalist Ava Evans that Ofcom has concluded were sexist, misogynistic and offensive. Fox an actor turned politician drew condemnation after asking what self respecting man would climb into bed with her during a live show. Wooden could be smiling and laughing throughout Fox's remarks before adding for a touch of balance, those are quotes, that Evans had qualified her comments and called her a very beautiful woman, quoting. Ofcom said Fox's remarks constituted a highly personal attack on Miss Evans and were potentially highly offensive to viewers, adding that the comments were clearly and unambiguously misogynistic. Well, thank you very much for that sunshine rain. Oh, as you know, I like Dan Wooten. I have supported Dan Wooten throughout this whole sorry saga. And I'm afraid I will have to continue to support Dan Wooten. Because notwithstanding the trouble you have gone to, to impart this condemnatory Ofcom ruling, I don't recall in one word that you have managed to come up with while criticizing Lawrence Fox that there is one criticism of Dan Wooten. So what is your point? That he loses a job because someone else made a comment that 
is regarded as misogynistic. Uh, and uh, what about the fact that Ava Santini Evans was the one who used the word shag repeatedly? And Lawrence Fox's comment was an allusion to the fact that she was constantly and repeatedly and frequently saying which man she would and wouldn't shag under which conditions. Now, I would have said that's also pretty anti-male, wouldn't you have? Because if Lawrence Fox is one comment is misogynistic. Surely the reverse is true of Ava Santini Evans. And since she did it repeatedly, the question one has to ask is, why were there no comments and complaints made to Ofcom about her repeated, disgusting slagging off of men. Because if Lawrence Fox's one comment was reprehensible, surely her many comments were that many times more reprehensible. And none of it, in any event, has anything whatsoever to do with Dan Wooten's uh, failure to be criticised by Ofcom. They didn't criticise him, did they, for his default position, which everybody who looks at the show knows, is when he's dubious about anything, he has a faint smile. And also, it's not the place of a presenter to be criticising and shutting down another presenter, because Lawrence Fox was also a presenter of GB News. So I don't see where the criticism of Dan Wooten that you are trying to imply using Ofcom's ruling against Lawrence Fox actually has any merit where Dan Wooten is concerned. I think I make myself perfectly clear in this regard, and we'll move on now to the final, which is TTM, who says, Dear Lady C, I know I'm a journey of your news is centering on the Markles, but do you have any information about the Princess Royal and her duties? She has always being portrayed as someone who just gets the work done, but seems to be an unseen hero. Can you confirm any of this or share any stories? The Princess Royal is the hardest working royal and has been for a long time. She gets on with the work and doesn't expect people to bow down and scrape oh, aren't you marvellous oh the duchess of sussex you're so marvellous oh you deserve to be given an award for getting out of bed and saying how wonderful you are oh sorry for us to say how wonderful you are do you know princess anne before she made any comment about save the children which was one of her first charities and one of her main charities. She worked, found out everything there was to find out about them over a period of time and not Meganian time, not two days or two weeks. And certainly not, oh, I'm an expert, I read two paragraphs of a briefing note. But I'm an expert. I'm going to teach Michael DeBakey how to implant hearts. <laughs> well, I'm actually going to start by implanting one on myself. <laughs> I mean, well, 
maybe I better not if there's no room for my heart in my chest maybe I'll go the way of Ian 12th Duke of Argyll who died when somebody was trying to put a heart in his chest because he hadn't had one either no she Princess Anne is a thoroughly professional down-to-earth pragmatic hard-working modest individual highly intelligent very energetic very motivated i've always said she's prince philip in skirts and she is very much her father's daughter but she's also her mother's daughter she was close to both her parents and she took leaves out of both their books but she was far more inclined to have a personality like her father than like her mother she can be quite charmless i have to tell you she can be quite <coughs> well let's stick to charmless oh uh, and go no further she can be quite charmless she can be brusque she can be uh dry but there's no doubt that she is authentically herself and that she has her head well screwed on she's a very good professional princess and most of her work goes on sun most of her activity goes on sun my own feeling where she is concerned is that she opted for being like the previous princess royal her great aunt mary her grandfather george the sixth sister who was lady harwood as well as the princess royal and she she was far more shy than princess anne princess anne isn't at all shy but princess mary was shy and she was self-effacing but and she was far gentler than princess anne but she was not glamorous and princess anne has gone down the de-glamorized stately role she has her hair in a very stately severe way which is very unflattering uh, she used to when she was younger deal with her hair so it didn't have that rather frizzy unattractive look that it now has her hairstyle doesn't suit her now I think that Princess Anne when she was younger because I was at things with her when she was younger and I remember saying once when somebody said I said yeah she's really very attractive full face on which she was the profile somewhat let her down because she didn't have a strong enough chin which someone else who didn't have a strong chin but has a built it up is Ivanka Trump but Princess Anne's chin was too weak for her nose profile wise but she never did anything with it but full face on when she used to straighten her hair and she used to color her hair she was actually a very attractive used to put on makeup wear glamorous clothes well she amazingly and i say this <laughs> with 
absolute wonderment that she can get into clothes that she wore 50 years ago. I, I certainly can't. And I think it's wonderful that she's kept her figure to the extent that she has. But she lets herself down, in my opinion, and lets her roll down by being so severe in her presentation, unglamorous, almost asexual, uh, which I think is a pity because she would be far more appealing photogenically if she were slightly more glamorous. Now, she's not a young woman, so, you know, Ron is not saying that she should come across as sexy, but I think there is a lot to be said for women of any age being as attractive physically as they can be. A bit of glamour goes a long way. It shows that you care. Yes, Princess Anne is well presented in that she is neat and clean, but I've never seen any merit in a woman deciding to expunge all desirability from her presentation. Let me put it that way. It takes 10 minutes. That's all it takes. Well, maybe 15, <laughs> maybe 15. <laughs> takes me 15 minutes to put on my makeup. I don't see why she couldn't do it in 15 minutes as well. So that's just my take on it. But she certainly is hardworking. And I do think when I say this, it's partly because if she had been slightly more, remained slightly more glamorous as she was when she was young, she would be photographed far more and her work would therefore reach a far greater audience publicly. You see, there is merit to certain forms of vanity. And on that note, I'll say thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been of some interest to you. If it has, Please keep the questions and comments coming in so I will know what you would like us to be speaking about. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. And if you have truly enjoyed this, would you care to like, share, subscribe, press the notification bell, and Godspeed.